Notebook 11, the 296th Regiment in Champagne. From the 19th of May, 1916, to the 12th of July, 1916. Part 1. On the last episode, we saw how Barthes and the rest of his comrades suffered on Hill 304 at Verdun, where they were subjected to constant and violent bombardments. After an intense day of battle, Barthes' regiment at last received orders to be relieved gradually from Hill 304, as the replacements appeared during the night. And the notebook ended with Barthes, two of his comrades from Periak Minerva, an orderly, and a violent sub-lieutenant called Hock, reaching the foot of Hill 304 and discovering that field kitchens were set up nearby. We will now see what happened after that. They soon discovered to their great joy that the field kitchens belonged to the 142nd Territorial Regiment, a regiment that had a good friendship with Barthes' own 296th Regiment, and a friendship that had been strengthened by their shared sufferings during the fighting in Artois in 1914 and 1915. The Territorials greeted the Palous warmly and gave them all the food and drink they wished. As they ate, Bartha saw the still-confused sub-lieutenant Hock walking around the place and suddenly threatening a random rationer with his revolver, demanding to know whether or not the man was an artilleryman. The terrified rationer managed to blurt out that he was a simple territorial, and the sub-lieutenant simply holstered his pistol, told him he was lucky, and left the stunned man behind. After asking the Territorials for directions, Barthes and his two Periosa comrades headed down the road towards the Saint-Pierre woods, the point where the regiment was supposed to gather. On the way, they met ragged, tired, and hopelessly mixed-up groups from the 296th Regiment. All unit cohesion had disappeared as the men made their way down Hill 304 and then through the fields and villages. Barthas commented with sadness on how the seven days on Hill 304, with constant thirst, exhaustion, insomnia, pain and anxiety, had turned the once sturdy and disciplined men into sad, miserable figures. Still, they were happy of just being alive. At a point on the road, the Palouse turned back to give one last look at the two hellish hills, Hill 304 and Dead Man's Hill. At that moment, the two hills were erupting like volcanoes with explosions, fires, and the lights of flares. Nearby, the Palouse saw hidden French batteries firing away with all guns. They wondered if this meant the Germans were launching a new attack. As they thought about it, a few shells exploded on a nearby hill. With this, they all decided it would be prudent to not linger any longer, and quickly resumed their march. At the town of Bethlehemville, they received directions for a shortcut that was supposed to save them one kilometer of marching. But there were so many small roads that the Palouse lost their way, and it ended up costing them an extra two kilometers. Eventually, they managed to reach the main road and found a large collection of soldiers from the regiment, with a few officers desperately trying to create some semblance of order among the hopelessly mixed-up units. Then, behind them, they saw two well-known and hated figures appear on horseback. One was Captain Adjutant Major Kro Meireville, glowering at the undisciplined ranks, while the other was Commandant Kansgram, constantly scanning the horizon in all directions, terrified of the possibility of any German planes appearing looking for his head. There was nothing in the sky besides birds, but the terrified commandant immediately ordered the soldiers to head towards the Saint-Pierre forest and disperse. Then the two officers rode away with their aides following close behind. Barthes' two companions rejoined their respective units, and so Barthes made his way on his own. The road the soldiers were following towards the Saint-Pierre woods made a large bend, 
and Barthes decided that to save time it would be far easier to go in a straight line through the vegetation instead of the road's long detour, besides the fact that it would give him an hour of pleasant strolling alone. He felt really smart that no other soldiers seemed to have had the same idea, and so went into the vegetation, but soon found out why no one else had done like him when he found himself face to face with a vast swamp. Still, he would not be discouraged, and he made his way through the swamp, smiling as frogs scattered before him. His joy abruptly disappeared when his foot got stuck in the mud, and, in the process of getting it unstuck, he fell into the water. After recovering, he got up and looked around very carefully. The innocent swamp now seemed much more dangerous. It would be very unfortunate to have survived the hell of Hill 304, only to sink and drown in a pod. Still, Barthas could see the distant tips of the trees of the Saint-Pierre woods through the vegetation, and he decided to keep going forward, though this time he made his way much more carefully, testing the depth of the water ahead of him with his walking stick, and often being forced to go around certain deep parts. In the end, his shortcut ended up being far longer and more tiring than expected, but eventually he managed to emerge back into the road and near the Saint-Pierre woods. As he did so, he saw other Poilus moving along the road. Amid them, he spotted one man who was dragging himself slowly along the street using a stick as a crutch, limping as if his leg had been broken. This man turned out to be Edouard Durand, the Pariasa from Barthes' section and whom Barthes had at one moment mistaken for a corpse back on Hill 304. Despite the fact that the man had stayed alone and exhausted in a flooded shell hole, indifferent to Barthes' pleas, he was still alive, though in a sorry state. During their stay at Hill 304, a shell explosion had thrown a rock that hit Durand right in the knee giving him a limp. Additionally, the man's feet were full of blisters, and so walking was very difficult and painful. Like Durand, all the other men were exhausted. They had finally reached the woods that was their rendezvous point, but it had taken them over twelve hours of marching. Barthas was about to stretch out on the ground like the rest of the men when suddenly Lieutenant Breton called him over. Barthas was expecting some kind of reproach for his muddy and filthy state, but instead was surprised and confused when the lieutenant congratulated him on his brave conduct on Hill 304. Barthas stammered out that he had done nothing, but Breton said how Lieutenant Loriot himself had reported on how Barthas had volunteered for a dangerous night reconnaissance, and how he had volunteered to replace a courier on the last day in that hill. Barthas wrote that as a pacifist and anti-militarist, being congratulated by the army for his actions annoyed him greatly, but he decided that for his future well-being it would be better to not make a fuss about these things, as they would help counter the black marks the commandant and the captain had put on his record. A moment later, as the soldiers were trying to rest, a sweating messenger arrived on a bicycle. He quickly gave a piece of paper to Commandant Kansgram and Captain Crow made a view. The two officers grimaced when they read the message, and soon the Poilus learned what was happening. It was an order from Colonel Douce to immediately retrace their footsteps and return to Hill 304, where the Germans were massing for a new assault. A chill went through the ranks. They were exhausted and were now being asked to retrace twenty kilometers under a scorching sun to go back to the carnage they had just been relieved from. A quarter of the battalion had not even managed to rejoin them yet. Some men said they would have to be carried back to the hill. Most simply stood in silence. The commandant declared that they would head out in one hour. There was supper but the Poilus had lost their appetite. Then a small cloud of dust appeared in the distance. 
A moment later, it revealed a nice staff car that parked before them. From the car emerged their divisional commander, a general called Andrieu. The commandant and the captain adjutant major immediately went before him. General Andrieu was beaming. I have good news, he said. The division is being relieved. The two worried officers showed the general the colonel's order. The man read them and frowned. The old devil, he said. This is very serious. The general looked around at the men and his eyes were full of pity. Then he got onto his car and said, I'm going back to headquarters. I'll fix this in an hour. And he was gone. The hour passed very slowly for the anxious Paulus. Finally, the staff car appeared. It no longer brought the general, but it did bring their definite order for relief, and this lifted a heavy weight from the shoulders of the Poilus. The orders explained that fresh troops would be arriving at the forest on trucks. As those troops disembarked, the Poilus of the 296th Regiment would climb onto the trucks, which would lead them to the place where they would rest. Then the Palus waited in the woods for the arrival of the trucks. Some men were so exhausted that they simply fell asleep where they stood under the scorching sun. When Captain Crow Mayreville noticed this, he immediately gave the order for everyone to go back into the shade in the forest, taking care to viciously curse and insult any laggards. Barthas wrote that it was a strange sight. Crow Mayreville. Such a supremely self-centered man, so violent and so cruel, looking over and taking care of the soldiers in his own ways like a concerned mother. Still, the soldiers' break under the trees was short-lived, as soon after the commandant ordered the men to grab their packs and move out. For a moment there was fear that they were being sent back to Hill 304 after all, but it turned out to be a different thing. Someone higher up had decided that to save on fuel, it would be better to stop the truck several kilometers short of the forest. Fuel cost money. The soldiers' fatigue did not. Those extra kilometers of marching reopened blisters and wounds on the soldiers' feet, while the straps of their packs dug painfully into their flesh. Eventually, the soldiers reached the meeting point, and a while after the trucks finally arrived, the poor, recent arrivals could hear the constant artillery bombardments coming from Verdun, and they looked at the muddy but relieved Palouse with envy. Meanwhile, the Palouse being relieved looked at the recent arrivals with pity. But there was nothing that could be done. Barthas and his comrades boarded their trucks and soon departed. Eventually, the trucks dropped them off at the town of Bethancourt, two kilometers away from the city of Saint-Dizier. Barthas' 15th company was billeted in a filthy barn with walls full of holes that still seemed like a palace to the Palous after the trenches. They slept well, and the next day General Andrieu appeared to announce that home leaves would be resumed after having been suspended for over three months. This brought great joy to the soldiers. That same evening, the first leave-takers left to the envy of everyone else. Barthas wrote of how to be able to return to their homes and embrace their families was one of the rarest and greatest joys the soldiers had, and very few would ever part with their leaves willingly, no matter the price. The next few days, the soldiers were surprisingly left alone, and they could rest and clean themselves for the first time in a very long while. In the evenings, and despite the strict prohibitions against it, Barthas and a couple of his comrades would go to visit the nearby city of Saint-Dizier. He commented that here, like in all places behind the front lines, life went on peacefully, as if it had been the year 2000 and Hill 304 was as far away as Mount Sinai. Time passed. The only annoyances during those days were the inspections by the obsessive Commandant Kansgram, who did not care what meager scraps the soldiers had to eat, 
but constantly worried about whether or not the latrines were in the exact predetermined position with the minimum required depth and width. He did not care about how the soldiers slept in filthy lodgings with no straw and walls full of holes through which the cold wind blew, but he threw fits if the squad's lantern was not hung on the correct crossbeam, and there was not a bucket of water next to the billet's entrance as regulations demanded. Additionally, the commandant only carried out these inspections well after he himself had acquired a nice lodging with a soft bed. In short, the commandant was a massive annoyance, and many started running out of patience. There was one incident the day after the battalion's arrival at the town. The commandant and his lackey, Captain Cromaderville, were carrying an inspection in the billets of the 22nd Company, and when they entered the place, they noticed among the Palus one particular man who was busy shaving and paid no attention to the two officers. The offended commandant immediately approached and reproached the man for his disrespectful behavior, threatening him with punishment. This particular soldier was short-tempered at the best of times, and today he was not in a good mood. The man stopped shaving, slowly turned around, and looked the commandant up and down with insolent eyes. Then he lashed out. You miserable, pathetic runt. You should have been visiting us on Hill 304, yet there you didn't dare to stick your nose out of your hole. Now that we have our first day of real rest, you dare bother us? Get out of my sight. The commandant and the captain were shocked into silence. Then, infuriated, they ordered the nearby Lieutenant Cordier to draw up charges against the rebellious soldier and left. The lieutenant decided to write the report, constantly emphasizing the hot-headed soldier's bravery on Hill 304, and how he had constantly volunteered for the most dangerous tasks. When the commandant read the report, he was stunned. I ask you for a list of charges to punish the man, and you give me a citation for a medal, he complained. The lieutenant replied that he had simply written the truth, and so... The soldier escaped from this incident with no punishment. Another incident happened the day after that. The commandant and the captain were walking through the town streets, carrying out their annoying inspections, when they stopped in front of the town hall. Next to the entrance to the building stood a sentry none other than Private Sabatier, the Perioisa, the man who barely knew French, the man who had been buried alive by shellfire and unearthed by shellfire. Now, with a brand new pipe in his mouth and his thoughts lost, wondering when he would get his next drink. The officers were angered when they saw that Sabatia's uniform was missing three buttons and was splattered with the mud of the trenches. They were infuriated when they saw that the private did not pull his pipe out of his mouth when they approached but they were absolutely scandalized when they saw that he did not deign to salute them as they passed. Immediately, the two officers approached the man and started lashing out at him, demanding to know why he did not pay the appropriate respects. Sabatier simply stretched out his arm towards the sun which was hidden behind the clouds and said in his broken French, Oh, sorry, the sun has gone down. The confused officers immediately demanded to know what he meant by this. Sabatier replied, I mean that on Hill 304 we never saw you. Here we will not salute you any longer. The meaning was perfectly clear to the two officers, who immediately fled the scene as if they had been shot at. Even the lowliest private reproached their cowardly behavior on Hill 304. They had long ago lost the soldiers' respect, but now they had won their contempt. With this incident, Commandant Kansgram sunk into a deep depression. He barely ate anything despite the best efforts of his personal cook, Richardi, another Pelesa and friend of Barthas who had managed the hotel. Barthas wrote that the Commandant never fully recovered from his wounded dignity, and eventually he left the battalion for good. 
captain adjutant major Crow Mayreville, on the other hand, was barely bothered by any of this, and he ate well. Meanwhile, worrying rumors reached the palouse of the other two battalions from the regiment, which had stayed behind at Verdun. Soon, those rumors proved to be true. On May 23rd, the remains of the two battalions rejoined the palouse at Bethancourt, and they were in a sorry state. Three companies had disappeared almost completely, while in other companies the sections had been reduced to the sizes of squads. Accounts were confusing, but what was clear was that the Germans had launched a large attack after a monstrous bombardment, and had occupied some of the trench lines, killing or capturing their inhabitants. The Germans had reached as far as the commandant's old dugout, where stretcher bearers, telephone operators and orderlies had to keep them at bay with volleys of hand grenades. Resistance was desperate, and there were many acts of true heroism that finally managed to break the attack. But the cost had been very high. Barthas was told that as many as 1,050 men had been killed, wounded or captured. It seemed that it would no longer be possible to send the 296th Regiment back to the front lines. Barthas also wrote that almost as if by a miracle, not a single Periosa had been killed or wounded during that fighting. With this fight, there were many congratulations on the bravery of the regiment, though Barthas wrote angrily that from that day on, the officers would tell all the newcomers about the soldiers' bravery that day but failed to mention how, if the soldiers had tried to save themselves, they would have been shot. There were also many croix de guerre which the officers granted according to their whims, beginning by awarding them to each other. Lieutenant Cordier stood out by refusing to draw up a list of men to receive the medals, saying that all his men had done their duty and that to give medals to a few would be a disservice to the sacrifices of the others. For this, Commandant Kansgram and Captain Crow Mayreville would later have their petty revenge on the lieutenant and his company. Later, on May 24th, the Poilus were informed that they would resume field exercises. Commandant Kansgram had already drawn up an extensive and intensive training program to hammer the emerging spirit of insubordination into submission. But the very next day, sudden orders arrived from the higher military authorities that instructed the 296th Regiment to embark for an undisclosed destination. The regiment left Bethancourt at six in the evening. The police thought they would go and embark at the nearby station of Saint-Dizier, but, to their great confusion, they were instead sent in the opposite direction. The landscape was beautiful, but the going was hard, and was soon made far worse when a terrible storm broke out that soaked them to the bone, and still they had to march through the rain. Night fell, until eventually, at 10 p.m., they stopped at the station of a village called De Ville. Then they were left to wait at the side of the road for two hours, exhausted, soaked, and shivering, until finally being loaded onto the train. The officers received first and second class carriages, while the Poilus were packed in cattle cars so tightly that they had to take turns sitting down. Then the train started moving. Soon after, at one of the stops, the Poilus read the station's sign. It said, Saint-Dizier. Instead of simply being sent to the nearby station of Saint-Dizier, the police had been sent on an exhausting four-hour march under the rain, then ordered to stand while shivering for two hours in the night, only to be loaded onto a train that stopped at Saint-Dizier anyway. Barthas was infuriated. He wrote of how there were laws that punished a man who treated an animal cruelly, but there was no punishment for those idiotic officers who cruelly abused of the soldiers under their command. Still, the journey by train continued, and they passed several villages. At one point, the train made a stop at the city of chalon sur marne and Commandant Kansgram decided to go to the restroom. But, for whatever reason, he stayed there far too long. 
The train waited for no one and it soon departed, leaving the commandant behind on his toilet. At the town of Couperly, the train stopped and the soldiers got out. This was the end of their 12-hour journey packed in cattle cars. The soldiers had to go and wait for several hours in front of the station under the rain. News of what had happened to the commandant soon spread through the ranks, accompanied by a general burst of laughter. It turned out their battalion could not go anywhere because Kansgram was the only one who knew what was their final destination, and he had jealously kept that secret to himself. Eventually, and sooner than expected, the commandant reappeared in an automobile that had just happened to be on its way to the town. Soon after, the battalion got the orders to move out, and thirty minutes later they reached their new barracks in the Champagne sector. And so we reach the end of this part of the 11th notebook. We've seen how Barthes's 296th Regiment has been pulled out of Verdun to be assigned to the Champagne region, though not before a brutal battle in Hill 304, where the regiment lost possibly as much as a third of its total force. Barthes and the comrades of his battalion were saved narrowly from this fate because they had been pulled out four days earlier. Still, one of the things that stands out the most in this episode is the complete confusion and lack of coordination in the higher command, which constantly gave contradictory orders and made the soldiers march endless kilometers on useless maneuvers, at the cost of their fatigue. We shall see how things go for the 296th Regiment in Champagne on the next episode. I'll see you until then, and I hope you all have a good day.